Salaam alaikum, brothers and sisters. Let's continue with our very interesting discussion. Subhanallah, that saying the best form of defense is attack doesn't apply more truly than this case. Not that Dawah is attacking, of course, I don't mean it in that sense, it's inviting. But the point being is without this proactive, what I call a proactive mentality, a proactive approach. And this is all to do with our psychology. How we think about ourselves. How do we think about ourselves as Muslims? Do we think about ourselves, O Muslim brothers, in India, in UK, in America, or wherever you are watching this program, how do you think about yourself as a Muslim living amongst non-Muslims? Do you think of yourself as people who are taking from the society? Do you think of yourself as being inferior? And I don't mean here, yes, some Muslims have a very arrogant attitude. But in reality, when we look at them, the way they behave is very servile. Really in your heart, do you look at the West as superior? Most people do. Scientifically, technologically, sociologically, militarily, educationally, people have this awe of the West. Do you really think that you have something to offer? See, this is the thing. How do you look at yourself? Do you look at yourself as a taker or do you look at yourself as a giver? So this is the proactive approach. Proactively, when you're a da'i, your self-image changes. It's called self-image psychology. How you think about yourself changes. You don't think about yourself as being someone who is just taking from society. No, I have something to give. I have the solutions. I have something to contribute. I am part of the solution, not part of the problem. So you want to see? How to reform the youth. Oh, we always talk about the youth. The youth are into drugs. The youth are into movies. The youth are into, oh, what should we do? Let's have camps. Let's have this. No, I to forget all of that. Make them du'at. Get them to give da'wah. That will change them. That will change the whole way they think about themselves. They, believe me. Get them inviting non-Muslims to Islam. Then they will begin, they will be forced to think about their religion. They will be forced to learn about their religion. And they will see when they start to compare Islam with other than Islam, believe me, Islam will only begin to look more and more beautiful. It will begin to make more and more sense. And all of these are the positive effects of da'wah. But the negative effects, then Allah says, punishment, humiliation. Wait for it. Allah's decision is going to come. He will humiliate you at the hands of your enemies. This is inevitable. It's actually just the sunnah of Allah. You'll see it in any civilization, any civilization. So this is the punishment, brothers. This is the punishment. Do we want to befall that punishment? No. So we need to make the effort. We need to struggle. We need to strive because it will happen personally in your life and it will happen to us collectively. So this is Surah Al-Asr. Now I want to tell you a very, very important story. This story itself was probably one of the most important things in motivating me to give da'wah personally. So this story has a very personal dimension for me. In fact, subhanAllah, when I first became Muslim, a brother, this brother, imagine he's going to get rewarded, inshallah, I pray he does, he will, for what I'm saying to you right now. Because this brother, he gave me a booklet. A small little booklet. But this booklet, just this one little booklet, inspired and motivated me to get involved in Dawah. And most of this booklet was about this story, which is the story of the Sabbath breakers. The story of the Sabbath breakers is about a group of people from the Beni Israel who lived in a village by the sea and they used to get their livelihood from fishing. But because these people had got used to doing wrong, and this shows that when you commit sins, when you commit sins, Allah sends upon you a fitna, a trial, a test, a tribulation. So because they had got used to transgressing, Allah sent upon them a fitna. Fitna means, what does a fitna mean? A, a test, a trial. So what was this fitna? Every single day, 
they would find there was no fish in the sea. Now, imagine, this is your livelihood. This is where you live. This is how you feed yourself and your family. Think about it. Think about this. Imagine something like this happened to you. Every day there was no fish in the sea. Nothing. But the one day they were not allowed to fish, what did they find? That's the Sabbath. The fish were jumping out of the water. So many fish. Now you may think that if this happened to you, you'd say this is a, a sign from Allah. Let me make tawbah. Let me change. And of course some people were like that. But one group amongst these people, what did they do? They decided to set their nets the night before. So the Sabbath begins like our day. When does our day begin? What time does our day begin? Maghrib, yeah. So when the sun sets, the Jews, by the way, the same thing. So just before Maghrib, they put the nets out in the sea. So they didn't do any work on the Sabbath, right? And then just after Maghrib, the next day, they collected the nets full of fish. And they say, you see, we didn't work on the Sabbath. We did the work before, and we did the work after. Found a way around it. Now this type of literalism, apart from, from anything else, surely you can understand this is a sign and a test from Allah. Surely what is intended is that you should not cause any work to be done on the Sabbath. Even if you do it before and do it after, you're missing the point. You're missing the real point you're still causing the fish to be caught. So there was a group amongst these people, they were giving da'wah. They went to these people, they said, listen, fear Allah, don't do this, stop this. You know, you're breaking the command of Allah. This is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they were giving them da'wah. And there was another group of people. They weren't breaking the Sabbath. They weren't disobeying the commands of Allah. But they said to the people who are giving da'wah, why do you bother with these people whom Allah is about to destroy and send upon them a terrible punishment? So they knew that Allah was going to destroy these people. They knew it. But they said to the ones giving da'wah, why are you bothering? So the ones who were giving da'wah, they said something very important. They said, so that we will do our duty before our Lord. They didn't want to stand in front of Allah and Allah will ask them, so they knew that da'wah was an obligation. Now if da'wah was farad al-kifayah, it would have been enough, right? You've got one group of doing it, that's enough. No, why are you bothering? Allah's going to destroy them. But if you look carefully in the Qur'an, brothers, and if you look carefully in the Qur'an, we see three groups of people. The Sabbath breakers, the ones giving da'wah, and the ones who are not breaking the Sabbath, but they were not giving down. But Allah only rescued one group of people. Allah mentions in the Quran the meaning of which is, we rescued those who forbade evil, and we sent upon the wrongdoers a grievous punishment. That means that Allah included the people who are not giving dawah as being amongst the evil people, and Allah transformed them into apes just as He transformed the people who broke the Sabbath into apes. What do we need, brothers and sisters, by way of admonition and mawidah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remind us, to show us and to illustrate us how da'wah is an obligation? How we need to be involved in da'wah? So this is a very, very strong warning. Very strong warning. In addition, Hudayfa said that the Prophet ﷺ said, By him in whose hand is my soul, meaning Allah, you must enjoy what is right and forbid what is wrong, or else Allah will send upon you a chastisement and you will make dua, but your supplication will not be accepted. Tirmidhi. You must enjoy what is right and forbid what is wrong. This is why, by the way, if you look in some of the books that talk about the etiquettes of dua, one of the things they mention as a reason for dua not being accepted is when people abandon enjoining what is right and forbidding what is wrong. So if we abandon dua, our dua does not become accepted. This motivates me. 
<laughs> it surely is going to motivate us, subhanAllah. Then another, subhanAllah, hadith. And Aisha, once the Prophet wasallam woke up and he'd seen in a dream, he said, woe be to the Arabs for what is going to fall to them. I have seen a hole this size in the wall that is keeping back a jujwa majuj. And Aisha, she said, will we be punished? Well, while there are righteous people amongst us, you think if there's good people, righteous people, are we going to be punished when there's still good people? And the Prophet ﷺ said, yes, when the evil is more than the good. So what do you think? What do you think then of us today? The world today, the Muslims today. And this is, by the way, both in Bukhari and Muslim, no doubting the authenticity of this hadith. So when the evil overtakes the good, it means expect the punishment and the chastisement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, this is motivating and should be motivating us to make sure to the best of our capability that evil does not overtake the good. So again, these are general hadith about good and evil, but of course all of it applies to da'wah to non-Muslims. It does. Not just only to subhanAllah. Of course it applies also and I did say that some of what we will be learning will apply generally to da'wah, to all in joining the right and forbidding the wrong. But the point here is all of this applies to motivate us to be from amongst the callers to Islam. And also I want to finish now. I love this hadith. It's a very beautiful hadith. And it's narrated by Numan ibn Bashir. Who related that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the example of the person who enjoins the right and forbids the wrong is as of the people in a boat. And the boat has two levels, the upper deck and the lower deck. The people on the upper deck have water, whereas the people on the lower deck have none. Brothers and sisters, we're going away for a short break. Don't go away, we'll be back soon. The words of wisdom from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ahmadillah. Praise Allah first. Achieve true wisdom through the Quran. How is the character of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? How he prayed at night? Allah loves the one who praises the praiseworthy Muhammad. Peace be upon him. If you send one salah on the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam, Allah will send upon you 10 salawat. Giving up the mercy of Allah is the act of shaitan. Shaitan wants you to take in that path of evil. He wants you to keep continuing on that path of evilness. Reflect on the verses of wisdom from Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Join Yusuf Idris in Revealed Wisdom every Tuesday at 4 p.m. and repeat telecast at 2.30 a.m. Saudi Arabia on Peace TV. Analyze your mistakes. Have you ever tried to overcome your anger? Realize your weakness. Do you find it difficult to control your tongue? Diagnose your moral sickness. Have you ever felt that your intentions are corrupt? Learn the steps essential to nourish our souls in purification of the soul every Thursday at 6 p.m. and repeat telecast at 5.30 a.m. Saudi Arabia on Peace TV. Marriage or divorce? What's Islamic rule? Solution or problem? Joint family system. Heaven or hell? Big fat You choose. Beauty, wealth, family status, virtue. Decide what you want. Decide your choice. Be sad or be happy. It's your choice. Join Dr. Zakir Naik in Better Half or Bitter Half next on Peace TV.
Welcome back, brothers and sisters. We're going to continue our discussion in this very interesting Dawah workshop. I want to finish now. I love this hadith. It's a very beautiful hadith. And it's narrated by Numan ibn Bashir. Who related that the Prophet wasallam said that the example of the person who enjoins the right and forbids the wrong is as of the people in a boat. And the boat has two levels, the upper deck and the lower deck. The people on the upper deck have water, whereas the people on the lower deck have none. But the people on the lower deck, they feel shy to ask the people on the upper deck for the water. So what do they start to do? They start to make a hole in the boat. So if the people on the upper deck do not stop the people on the lower deck, what's going to happen? Yeah? Yeah. They all will die. Everyone is going to drown. This is, subhanAllah, the similitude of enjoying the right and forbidding the wrong of giving Dao. Let us think about this beautiful, I love this hadith because it's, subhanAllah, has lots of meanings. When you think of the boat, first of all, you must think of the Ark of Nuh. You think about Islam. Islam is like the Ark of Nuh. Whoever is in it is saved. Whoever is not in it is destroyed. Inna deena inda Allah al-Islam. Verily the religion with Allah is Islam. And whoever chooses a deen other than Islam, their fate is a terrible fate. So this boat, think of the Ark of Nuh. The upper deck and the lower deck. You can think of this in two ways. One, as the ulama in respect to the ordinary Muslims, and another one as the Muslims on the upper deck in respect to the rest of the people in the world. So if we think on the upper deck of the ulama and the ordinary Muslims are on the lower deck. The water either way is the Quran. It is the knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given. That quenches the thirst the people have. What is the thirst? The true thirst is the first to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the thirst of the soul. What quenches that thirst is the Quran and the knowledge of Islam. Who are the possessors of this? The ulama. But if the people feel shy to approach the ulama, and the ulama are not connected with the people, then the people will try to get the water from any place they can. So they dig a hole in the boat. They will try to get their enjoyment, they will try to get their happiness from wherever where they can. So if the ulama do not stop them, then what will happen? Everyone will be destroyed. It is the same case as the Muslims. We the Muslims similarly, we have the Quran. We have that which gives life. It gives life to the hearts. The non-Muslims are the people on the lower deck. But brothers, if they can't approach us for whatever reason, because we behave arrogantly, we behave proudly, we do not care about the people and live amongst them in a way that we care about them and share their concerns. Many of them believe me. They have a type of knowledge. They know Islam. They know, yes, the Muslims, they have this Quran. They, a lot of them know. They know there's something special there. But they never think to come to us. This, we know cases of this, subhanAllah, in England. People who are too afraid to even go near the Muslims, they find them too scary. They never smile. I told you we'll have to keep smiling. I know this is very serious, so it's okay if you're not smiling for this bit. And there's another strange thing, brothers. You know, in the Muslim lands, maybe this is not so important in India, but in England. Why is it that when Muslims go to England, they want to build a mosque that looks like it came from India? Think about it. If you think about it, imagine if you're an Englishman and you're seeing this building that looks like it's been imported from a village in India. How are you going to feel about that? You think, what is this strange alien thing in my land? Will he think, oh, I can go in there? Or will he think, oh, that's just for Indians? Which one do you think he's going to think? Yeah? Yeah, he thinks this is not for me. This is for someone else. This is because the people who went there didn't go there thinking of dawah. Yes, they thought, how will we protect ourselves? We're surrounded by these people doing, look, girlfriends, boyfriends, alcohol, all this crazy stuff. Let's protect ourselves. Let's recreate a little bit of India here. In England, let's recreate a bit of Pakistan, let's recreate. So that's it, they never thought of dawah. They never thought, will the non-Muslims find this attractive? 
we've got something to share, we've got a message to give. No. It's not the way they were thinking. See, so the people on the upper deck have the water, but the people on the lower deck, they're not going to them. I'm not going to ask them. What do they do? Start drilling a hole. So if the people on the upper deck don't stop them, and it won't be enough to stop them, will it? Just to stop them is not enough. Because if you just stop them, they will get thirsty again, right? You have to share the water. You have to not only stop them, but you have to share the water. This, you see what a beautiful comprehensive hadith this is? And it really tells us something about the dunya as well. This is a reality. Of, this is not about akhir, it's about the dunya. You know, brothers, you can isolate yourself all you like. Whether you live in America or UK or India. And I'm not saying Muslims shouldn't live in communities. I'm not saying that. But it's about your attitude. If you're living in these communities and you isolate yourself and you cut yourself off and you alienate yourself, let me ask you a question. When your kids go to school, I don't know in India, do most Muslims go to a school with only Muslims or are most of the schools like mixed? They're mixed. Now I don't know about India, but in UK, there's many places in UK, especially in the big cities, where gang violence is normal. Children are getting beaten up, mugged, stabbed, shot, I used to live in a part of UK, a part of, well, it's not actually London, it's outside London, but it's, you'll never know. It's called Croydon. There was a time when there were people being shot every single, shot, it's not normal for us to have guns, shot every week. Children, there was a kid down the road stabbed. They, they burst into his house and stabbed him to death. And this was happening, one or two of these every week. Kids getting shot, bystanders getting shot. So. When my kids go down the school, is the fact that they're Muslim, what does it mean? They're immune to bullets and knives? Are they immune to drug dealers coming and trying to persuade them to take drugs? Are they immune to it just because they're Muslim? Or are our kids just as exposed to these evils as every other kid? Which one is it? So if you don't take part in making society better, your kids are going to just be affected like everybody else. This is just common sense, yes or no? So if you just sit and let the evil happen, and you don't participate in improving and developing and making society, and we know the only cure, really at the end of the day is what? What is the only cure for the ills of society? Is what? Islam. We know that. So we'll all sink, brothers. Muslim and non-Muslim, we'll all suffer. We all live in this planet together, right? So we all have a common interest. And the duty is upon us and the obligation is upon us because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the guidance. So brothers and brothers and sisters listening, I hope this makes you realize that da'wah is imperative right now. We're not talking about the akhirah, we're talking about this dunya, that if we don't get involved, in enjoining right and forbidding the wrong and calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and calling to his deen, we will suffer in this world, let alone what is going to happen to us when we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So on one hand we have seen the great rewards and on the other hand we have seen the terrible consequences and the terrible punishment. It's your choice. Which one you want to take? You want to be giving da'wah or not? I hope this has now reinforced our commitment, our sincerity, and our intention to learn how to give da'wah. So, inshallah, that's it for now, and we'll be continuing next time, inshallah, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all. Make sure you all come, brothers. Inshallah, we'll see you then. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. مشفق متعطف لا ينتهي بالحصر ما أعطاه آه رب الرحيم 
مشفق متعطف كل هو الله احد سيد الله وان اونلي الله ذا